So in this discussion, I want to get a little bit deeper into just the device concept of a basic floating gate MOSFET device. Now, one could spend a whole lot of time talking about some of the programming mechanisms. That's not quite the focus of this discussion yet. But I want to talk about, imagine I have a floating gate device, and we often just draw this transistor. Um, it'll be a transistor and a tunneling junction and some input voltage. Uh, and the tunneling junction is a capacitor to which you can actually get current electrons to be pulled off of this floating gate. So you ask, well, what does this actually look like when I dig into this question? You know, am I looking at this from a layout perspective? Am I looking at this from a block diagram? And when I look at it from a layout perspective, what I'm going to see is this very interesting structure beneath it, which is basically, here is a typical MOSFET. It doesn't look anything more surprising than having, say, say a PFET sitting in an end well with a piece of end diffusion and a gate on top of it. No surprise there. When we talk about a capacitor, it looks simply just like poly 1, poly 2 capacitor. You could use a range of capacitors. Now, if somebody gives me poly 1 and poly 2 in a process, I'm almost certainly going to take it. Um, one of the big things with any capacitors is that you'd like to have no contacts on this floating gate, which is one contiguous piece of poly. Um, contacts tend to be a source of leakage and errors into the, into the substrate. It tends to be. Now, it depends on the process. Right? Some processes is going to be an issue. Some processes it's not, um, at least as far as we can tell. Um, but certainly the safest thing is having no, not needing any contact. So if I can get a second level capacitor here, I would love to have it. Um, on the other hand, as you go smaller and smaller processes, unless it's a specific double e prompt process, you may not. So you may be doing MOS capacitors and so forth. Concepts still hold just fine. In fact, one of our favorite MOS capacitors is an accumulation cap underneath here, which is done in n -well which is actually for the tunneling junction to actually do the, do the tunneling. Uh, we like this particular cap because the insulator, the, the insulator thickness underneath is extremely high quality um, and exactly the same sort of gate insulator that I would have had under this device. So I know that I can get billions and billions of erases without any trouble using going through the tunneling. If I look at it at a top level, kind of flipped around for you, uh, is that, you know, again, you'll have your input gate, source drain, N well and you connect this and of course there'll be an N well and usually an N plus region sitting in the N, re N plus region um, in this in the space and so typically that's the kind of game that you're going to see as you put this together. An interesting question when you think about a MOSFET of course if you think it from a classic double EEPROM approach you think about the gate being just on top of the on top of the poly over the over the device. Now typically we actually don't build it this way. Um, it doesn't give us enough freedom, typically, to build all of the different analog structures we're looking for. If that's, you know, so again, you look at a structure like this, this is much more typical because it allows me to make the cap the size I want, makes the device the size I want, allow me to potentially do different things. Maybe I have multiple caps, maybe I have multiple structures. But people who think about double EEPROMs will typically think about a structure that looks like this in a vertical stack. And this is actually a perfectly good way to build it. And a perfectly good way to kind of think about it in terms of a circuit representation I want to talk about here. Because when I talked about a single MOSFET down here, when we talked about, well, what does this look like between gate and current, we, the key question was what was the surface potential? And we realized that that was actually a capacitor divider from gate voltage to the substrate. We have two different capacitors in that divider, and we we're actually able to make this work. Uh, in terms of the psi is the change in these two quantities getting to this capacitor divider. Now there's a constant here in terms of its overall charge and that charge is very important as people want to change and modify what threshold voltage would be. You'll, you've often heard about people talking about putting charge into the insulator to change the threshold voltage typically right at the edge of you know, the, the uh, interface of the insulator. And this is exactly the idea. So you have a threshold voltage that's exactly a nice, happy place for all the circuit kind of concepts, particularly say CMOS inverters. And so that is actually implicitly a capacitor divider where there's a charge change. Um, it's very interesting for people who haven't thought about capacitor dividers, to, and when they have to wrestle with this concept, it's actually uh, quite a convoluted reasoning of why it works. But it's actually a very simple idea when you, when you bring it in this perspective. When you look at this a little further, though, you say, well, okay, now let me look at this as a whole structure from the gate all the way down. And that would give you a MOS capacitor and gate through here. So if you thought about MOS capacitors, what you would see is you have a gate through the poly-poly oxide, uh, assuming you're doing a large enough process where it's oxide versus, say, 
afnium oxide in more recent processes. Um, polysilicon gate, silicon dioxide again, and the depletion layer just like you would expect. What's interesting here is you now take a look at my floating gate FET and it really is a set of three capacitances. Going from the gate through the coupling gate to the floating gate, another capacitor to psi to ground, and what I've effectively built is just a capacitive network. If I'd had multiple capacitors of floating gate, I could have just modeled them all as capacitors, and it's one big capacitive network, which means that basically from gate voltage to floating gate voltage to surface potential, this is a direct, nearly basically DC coupling all the way through, as drawn as a DC coupling. And this is a very natural part of the circuit. So it's no surprise that adding another gate on this just gives me something that looks just like a MOSFET. And if I think about it from gate to surface potential, now there's now there's two capacitors, but it's still going to give me an effective kappa from the gate to the surface potential based on basically the capacitive network that I have built at this stage. And you would continue to see this built up as you as you continue. And so basically I want you to have kind of a physical picture of what a floating gate structure looks like and to realize that it really is in the end just one big capacitive, um, capacitive divider structure, which doesn't surprise us that much when it's a simple MOSFET. It really shouldn't surprise us when we actually do it in these spaces and then really allows us to open up the possibilities that we can now build.